We're speaking with Professor Abraham Zion, the uh, chairman of the Center for Law and Mass Media at Ariel University. Uh, Professor uh, Zion is uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, having spent a year sabbatical at Stanford University, and he's here with us, with us to speak today about the research that he's been doing on the uh, origins of uh, the Israeli founding and research on the Arab-Israeli conflict. That's true. Right. Professor, we're, we're approaching now this, this new year, 2018, in which Israel will celebrate its 70th anniversary. We just had the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration establishing Israel, and yet questions persist uh, in the public discourse of the legitimacy of the establishment of the State of Israel. What sort of work are you coming across in your research and, uh, and the book that you're preparing? Well, as anybody knows, it's common knowledge that uh, the British uh, conquered Palestine, conquered actually the Middle East from the Turks in the First World War. That's a war that started in 1914 and ended in 1918. And by 1918, the British got hold of all the Middle East. The British actually fought together with the French and with the Russians and with the Italians. And the United States was uh, in, in the picture. Now, in the uh, peace agreement that was made by in Versailles and later on in uh, uh, San Remo, uh, the Turks, the Turkish government, has renounced every right that it has on the Middle East uh, in, for the benefit of the Allied powers. In other words, the Allied powers could actually do with that, with this territory, whatever they pleased. Mm -hmm. They decided, in conjunction with the League of Nations at the time, that uh, was born at that time, they decided, instead of annexing those territories, as was uh, uh, the practice at that time, they decided to uh, put on mandates. And the mandates, the uh, reason for the mandate, was to bring those people into a self-determination. So actually, the Allied powers, not only the British, but also the French and the, and the Italians and the Russians, they all decided that this territory, which is called the Middle East, should be divided between the Jews and the Arabs. Let me point out that there was no difference between Arabs of Syria, Arabs of Palestine, Arabs of Mesopotamia, that's Iraq, or Arabs of the Hujaz. They all were considered Arabs, and they were represented by one person, that's uh, uh, King Hussein of the Hijaz, whose son, Faisal, was the person in touch with the Allied powers. Mm -hmm. What was the Faisal-Weizmann agreement? Let me come to this in a minute. Okay. But, but let me say that uh, the, the Allied powers decided to, defy, to divide the Middle East between the Jews and the Arabs, and the Arabs got the whole Middle East except Palestine. Now, Palestine was uh, uh, detached from Syria for one reason only, to build a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. It was quite known that the national home for the Jewish people in Palestine was, in fact, uh, later on to become a state, an independent state. But of course, at that time, they couldn't decide whether it's going to be a state or not because most of the Jews were outside Palestine. And it all depended on the Jews, whether they would come, they would immigrate to this barren land with uh, malaria and, and swamps, whether these people would come over and become a majority and uh, establish a state. Uh -huh. When Arabs claim that, well, there are Arabs there, more Arabs, in the land uh, longer, uh, but uh, certainly in the uh, mid-1800s, that there were more Arabs who were living there than Jews, and what right did the Jews have to, uh, to come and establish, uh, to colonize, essentially, uh, this territory for a Jewish state? Well, there's no this territory. There was the whole Middle East. We're talking not about the particular territory. We're talking about the whole Middle East. The whole Middle East was divided between Jews and Arabs in that way that the Jews got Palestine, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was known as Palestine, and the Arabs got all the rest. So those people that lived in Palestine were supposed to become later on minority. At that minority, time, were, minority of Israel, minority of the state of Israel to be to, to yes. which which would be established. Because at that time, it is true, the Arabs were a majority, but the Arabs of Palestine were not. There was nothing particular to speak about the Arabs of Palestine. The Arabs of Palestine was part of the whole Arab hemisphere.
-hmm. And uh, when the uh, Allied powers divided this country, they, the, the Middle East, they de decided that this area will become Jewish and the, the rest of the uh, Middle East will become uh, Arab. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is uh, that how all the other Arab states or in the area, in the region, got developed also uh, as, as, as independent modern states? Like Iraq, yeah, for instance, exactly. Syria, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Libya. That's what I'm saying. So in, in other words, the decision to give the Jews a national home was the same decision, the same decision exactly to give the Arabs independence in Mesopotamia, in Syria, and Lebanon, and Hijaz. It was the same decision. It was the San Remo Agreement. It was in the same time that it was made. So if you want to, if, if anybody wants to say that the, uh, the Jews have no right or the agreement the British or the Allied powers did not have a right to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, then in the same manner they should say that they had no right to establish an Arab state in Mesopotamia and in Syria and in Lebanon, in the same, in the same way, because it was decided uh, simultaneously, not uh, one after the other, simultaneously at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now what happened was, the uh, Weizmann um, approached uh, Faisal, uh, uh, Weizmann, uh, who was Weizmann, please? Weizmann was a, uh, a person, he was a, a Jew from Russia who emigrated to England. He became a professor at the University of Manchester. Is, is, is Weizmann? No, no, no. Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann was a, a, an immigrant from Russia. He emigrated to England. He established himself in England. He became the head. He became the president of the uh, Zionist organization of the UK and later on of the whole Jewish hemisphere. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he was very close to Lloyd George and to Balfour. Mm -hmm. In fact, without Wiseman, the Balfour Declaration would never have been given. In other words, he was very hard to get the Balfour Declaration and he, his influence was very great. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you one thing. Lloyd George was the Prime Minister mm -hmm. of the greatest nation on Earth a hundred years ago. The that was the Empire. The, the, it was the British Empire. Mm -hmm. which really uh, was from one side of the world to the other side of the world. It was something like, you would say, uh, close to what the United States is today. It, it was a very powerful nation, uh, mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And the United Kingdom, or Great Britain, the Prime Minister of Great Britain said that Wiseman was one of the greatest leaders of the Jewish people at all times. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the uh, strength, mm -hmm. the all of this, uh, how awesome it is for, for uh, a prime minister to address uh, uh, Weizmann in this manner. So Weizmann was a very powerful man, uh, and he, he was also a very clever person. He, he knew how to, he was a very a fantastic statesman and politician, and we were lucky, the Jewish people were lucky to have them at that time. So uh, he approached Faisal. Faisal was a representative of all the Arab peoples all the Arab peoples. He was a representative uh, and uh, he spoke in their name. He spoke also for the Arabs of Palestine. By the way, the Arabs of Palestine fought against the British. They fought with the Turks against the British. So really, the British and the French owed them nothing. And they said this in conferences, in the uh, peace conference in, uh, in Versailles and later on, that they owed the Arabs of Palestine nothing because they did not even help them. The ones who helped them were this was King Hussein of Hijaz, and they wanted to give him, uh, uh, to give his two sons, uh, Abdallah and Faisal, they, they wanted to give them a kingdom. One of them was in Mesopotamia, the other, was, the other one was in Jordan. So uh, Faisal approached, uh, sorry, uh, Weizmann approached Faisal. They had a wonderful discussion. Faisal admitted, admitted, verbatim, uh, in writing, Mm -hmm. that, the, uh, that the Palestine was not in the area of the uh, Arabs. In other words, the, the, uh, the independence, the Arabs, mm -hmm. that the, the Arabs were promised, did not include Palestine. You can see this from this document very clearly. Mm -hmm. But later on, he changed his mind because of pressure, mm -hmm. and he started asking for Palestine as if it was part of the Arab uh, area that, that the British promised, the British or the Allied promised them. But of mm -hmm. course this, this had no, uh, uh, no, no uh, basis at all. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in, in so he re reneged on that agreement. Sorry? He reneged, he dis disavowed his, his uh, commitment, his, his request in that agreement. Was there, was, there, was, there was a change of heart, there was a, 
uh, later on he he, um, he came back on his word and the agreement was signed mm -hmm. and it's written in plain words and in these words he uh, he admits that there are two states the Arab state and uh, and, and a state in Palestine and uh, they were not the same that Palestine was different and even Lord George wrote in his uh, memoirs that Faisal regarded Faisal spoke for all the Arabs regarded uh, Palestine as a different matter, a unique matter. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the funny thing is that after 70 years, the only country in the world, the only country in the world that so many countries are, are having doubt about its legitimacy, that's Israel. Mm -hmm. And this is the country where in international law, the, the basis is so solid, so mm -hmm. strong, mm -hmm. so clear, that one and is amazed how the uh, how the nations could mm -hmm. twist the facts and actually regard them with hypocrisy. Now, if if Israel was established uh, by a vote in 1947, November 29, 1947, what was that? It was the partition plan. The partition plan. What is that part exactly? The partition plan um, after the uh, British stopped the immigration of Jews to uh, Palestine. By the way, the whole idea was of the Balfour Declaration and those who uh, supported it was that Jews would be uh, Jews and Jews alone would be allowed to immigrate to Palestine freely, to purchase land and to build settlements and to become majority in order to take the country over. That was the whole concept. That was the whole idea. Mm -hmm. But in 1939, the White Paper of the British government mm -hmm. decided to stop immigration. And that was contrary, totally contrary, to what was promised to the Jewish people. So there were there was quite a lot of uh, trouble and turmoil, mm -hmm. and the British decided that they cannot control the area anymore. So they brought it to the United Nations, and the United Nations uh, uh, appointed uh, UNSCOP, that's uh, the uh, uh, United Nations uh, Special uh, Committee. Mm -hmm. to see what can happen, what, what will be the future of Palestine. And they decided to divide what was left of Palestine, because I didn't say that before. Uh, Churchill actually made the first division of Palestine. Mm -hmm. He took part of the eastern part of the Jordan, and he built and he established a country out of nothing, uh, and he called it Jordan, and he brought Abdullah from uh, the, uh, the Hijaz, that's Saudi Arabia, uh -huh. And he made him king, he made him at that time prince, and then later on he became king. Uh -huh. So that was the first partition. The second partition, what was left of Western Palestine, Ulskop decided to uh, divide it again, and to divide it in a way that was impossible to live with, but that's what happened. They divided it again, they made Jerusalem as a part of an international entity, and they divided uh, the uh, country into six parts three for the Jewish people and three for the uh, Arabs, but the, the Jewish people accepted it. Uh, they had no alternative. They had to accept it because they wanted to a state. And don't forget 1947, there were so many Jews from the Holocaust that were waiting for the doors of Palestine to open and they, for them to, to have a home after, after five years of Holocaust. Uh, so they had no alternative and they said they would accept it, but the Arabs uh, did not accept it. And the second day, they invaded uh, what was left of uh, Palestine, in, in fact, into Israel, and they lost the war. That's that's their Nakba. That's their Nakba. They tried they tried to annihilate the Jewish state, and they failed. In so they regard, you're saying. Yeah, and they yeah. they regard this as a disaster. Yeah, but it's, it's the same thing as a disaster when somebody wants to kill another, and he fails, and he gets injured, uh -huh. and uh, and then he blames the other part. How come he won and uh -huh. uh, the, the attacker lost? Uh -huh. So the, the Israeli war of independence was actually a war of defense. Wasn't exactly. like we had to fight the British. Exactly. If the Arabs would not have invaded the state of Israel when it's from every direction, direction. If, if they it would not have invaded, mm -hmm. then you would have had a partitioned country mm -hmm. that one of them is called Palestine and the other one is called Israel and there you are. Mm -hmm. But they so didn't how, accept it. Uh -huh. Was it at that time? Was it the League of Nations or the United Nations? No, 1945, uh, the United Nations was established. Okay. And 1948 was the United Nations. But everything that has that uh, preceded 
the United Nations uh, became part of the United Nations. In other words, these things did not uh, disappear. Mm -hmm. So it must be difficult for Israel to claim today that the very same uh, entity, the, the United Nations, which was legitimate enough to establish Israel's uh, independence, or uh, you know, uh, to, to vote in that, uh, today comes up with resolutions against Israel that Israel is trying to say not only the resolutions are false, but the, that the, uh, the institution is corrupt. That is fantastic. The only country that is attacked every now and again, maybe 86% of the time, maybe 90% of the time, sometimes even more, is only one state, that is Israel, the most stable, democratic country in the, in the whole region. And the, also the only state that is safeguarding the Christian uh, religion and the, the Muslim religion in the same way as it's regards the, regarding the uh, Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. So Israel is attacked uh, again and again under false pretenses. And then, uh, it, it's actually a political decision. All the decisions have nothing to do with justice. They are all political and they are all anti-Israel because you must understand one thing. Israel is the only Jewish country in the world. While, in the same way, you have 57, 57 Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. And you have 22 Arab countries. So when you see the balance, you see that every country decides on what's, what's good for her. And it, according to that, they uh, raise their hands. It has nothing to do with justice. It has nothing to do with international law. It has nothing to do with the facts. So in your research on international law, are you claiming that when the uh, Palestinian spokespeople like uh, Eric Katz and uh, Han Kanan Ashrawi come out and say, uh, Israel's in violation of international law, everyone agrees on that? This is total rubbish. This is total rubbish. But I, I'm very sad to say that it has become an axiom. In other words, when they say that Israel is in violation of the uh, international law, Everybody agrees without asking why, without asking why. For example, when Kerry was in Israel, when Secretary Kerry was in Israel, he was asked by a, a reporter, an Israeli reporter, uh, about uh, the uh, attacks of the Arabs, and he said that the, uh, Israel, as long as Israel is occupying those territories uh, illegally, then the Arabs will, will continue to show the Israeli uh, villages. <laughs> But the reporter failed to ask him, from who did we occupy those territories? If he would have asked Kerry this mm -hmm. question, I'm mm -hmm. sure Kerry would not have any answer. From whom did we occupy this territory? In fact, we're the only country we occupied this territory from was Jordan. But Jordan was keeping that territory illegally, and nobody actually uh, accepted uh, the uh, rule of Jordan in mm -hmm. the what's called in the, the, West, in the West Bank. Yeah, Judea and Samaria. Yeah. You know, uh, we say West Bank because the, it's, a, it's an Arab narrative. Yeah. And it's an Arab narrative is so quickly to be taken as, a, as for granted. But, you know, I went through hundreds of uh, British cabinet and British foreign office uh, instruments and papers and decisions. There was no West Bank there. All of them, all these uh, the documents were referring to Judea and Samaria. None of them was referring to the West Bank. Uh -huh. but so for people who are not familiar with, with what the West Bank is, I mean, geographically, we're just referring to it as the West Bank, or I refer to it now, and I think people, people refer to it as the West Bank, to distinguish it from Jordan proper, and then there's the Jordan River. This is west of the Jordan River, right, the West Bank of the Jordan River, which is Judea and Samaria. Is that correct? Well, you can't have a, a, a river bank. You know, the Jordan River is one of the smallest rivers that you can, you can even think of. Uh, there's no comparison to such a river anywhere in Europe or in the, in the United States. It's a very, very small river. Now, now you, tell me, you tell me how come that a bank of a river has cities and villages and towns and roads and streets and, and all sorts of... The, the, this, uh, this is a misnomer. It's, uh, it's, it has nothing to do with a bank of a river. Okay, but the, the territory that you're referring to was not determined in the uh, in the the final um, the last uh, uh, legal agreement as to what would be the future determination of Judea and Samaria. Is that correct? 
Uh, what, what do you mean by the question? What, well, you were saying uh, that, that Jordan, technically, even though Jordan had, had rights to its own territory, Judea and Samaria, to the left, essentially to the west of the Jordan River, was technically the future, of, uh, it was left in limbo, subject to future agreements after, these, after the Arab-Israeli wars. Well, I'm not sure about that, because uh, uh, this, is, this is territory that is part of Western Palestine, and Western Palestine had been promised to the Jewish people under international law. So I don't think that this, this area, which is called the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria, had anything to do with Jordan. Jordan occupied this territory under aggression, and it had uh, no, no case in, those, in this territory. And it's, <laughs> the, the, the future of the territory was not dependent on, on whether Jordan would accept it or not. But of course, I'm not talking about the, uh, um, uh, the Oslo Agreement. The Oslo Accords uh, changed things a little bit, uh, but the Oslo Accords, of course, were not carried out by the Arabs. No, not even a, a one sentence of it was carried out. So, in fact, it's, uh, the Oslo Agreement is at limbo, but not uh, the future of Jordan, uh, the future of uh, Judea and Samaria. So let's, if we may, take it to the, uh, the current day, 2018. Uh, Israel still has its detractors, not only from the Arab side, but also from uh, Israelis. And one name that comes to mind is Miko Pellet, who uh, you debated on One America News Network, uh, live yeah. on television. Uh, and he's a, a, a member of a, a category uh, often referred to as the new historians. Uh, Norman, Norman Finkelstein, Avi Shalane, Ilan Pape. Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't say that he is a historian in any in any sort and in, in any way. Uh, I think he's distorting uh, the history. He, uh, I saw in one of, the, of his websites that uh, he asked who said that the Jews of today are the descendants of the Jews of uh, King Solomon and uh, and uh, King David. I mean, this is I, I couldn't hear anything ridiculous. I don't think anyone in the world. Suspects that the, the, this is not the case, and he brings it up as a Jew, mm -hmm. as a Israeli, mm -hmm. as a son of a general, of an Israeli general. Mm -hmm. So it's like he gives himself a lot of authority, but it's uh, it's uh, nonsense. It's total nonsense. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in, in in his debates, he is so anti-Israeli that I I wonder. I think I would have spent some time researching into the why why did this happen? How come that these people become so anti their own people and they distort the facts in order to help our enemies against ourselves? It's you a think pitiful it's a, it's a psychological phenomenon. It's a pitiful situation and I think there is something psychology in this. There is no doubt about it. Because the Jews have uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, after two thousand years in the diaspora after so much suffering, after the fact that they had to uh, appease all sorts of uh, conquerors and all sorts of other people, leaders of other nations, that they became uh, more, uh, they, they appealed much more to the enemy than to themselves and their own people, and they actually become very, um, very hard. They go very hard on their own people and on themselves. It's like self-hating Jews. It's a phenomenon that you don't find it in any other nation. I don't, I cannot think of any other nation, Let's take for example the British during the Second World War, would anyone go and, and praise Hitler in, in public and, uh, and, and uh, write books on that and try to prove that Hitler mm -hmm. is more moral than the British people? That's, that's what the Jews, that some of the academia try to prove that the Arabs are more moral, the Arabs who are uh, terrorists are more moral than the Jewish people uh, who are trying uh -huh. to uh, maintain peace as much as they can. Uh -huh. But uh, the academics, academicians that you're referring to, uh, teaching at places like the London School of Oriental Studies? Yeah. Or, th or are they teaching in more mainstream, what you consider to be mainstream? Uh, no, no, I think, I think that, uh, that that's, uh, that's my feeling. I haven't really studied that, that uh, uh, to the depths of it. But I uh -huh. think well, that, what, what, have you what have you encountered in places like California? Well, I think that millions, I would say billions, billions of dollars are pouring into those universities to establish a, a picture, a distorted picture against Israel and uh, against the Jewish people. And uh, I must say that they are succeeding in, uh, in doing so 
uh, to a certain degree, degree and also uh, you find quite a few Jewish intellectuals and Israeli intellectuals uh, following suit and uh, trying to uh, uh, go on this uh, street that is anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Even Jewish teachers in the Middle East studies in the yeah, U.S.? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about Jewish teachers. I met a few in UCLA. Mm -hmm. I met a few in other places, and uh, you can find that they are uh, anti, they are anti-Israel and in, in no logic term, in no logic term, because if they had to, to prove anything that they're saying, uh, they would have been, they would have failed. But when it comes to uh, attacking their own people, they are much more, uh, I would say, much less uh, conscious or yeah, rigid. Uh -huh. how, how would you uh, characterize uh, Israel as a country, the government, their own um, ability to manage the public diplomacy and, uh, and public relations of their, their legitimacy and the things which are taking place today in the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Palestinian conflict, uh, what's happening in the UN, and, and the way that the media, international media, is is reflecting and depicting uh, the situation in the international press. Well, I think Israel is doing very little. Israel is not paying much attention to the situation, to the anti-Semitism in the world, and to the, the uh, defamation against the uh, Israel, against the Jewish people. And it's spending very little uh, money and attention and uh, and uh, strength on on this matter. I don't know. I don't know why. I think it's wrong, but that's the situation. I investigated this a uh, long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when uh, the Oslo Accords came into uh, came came into uh, effect, 1993 was it? That's true. It's the 13th of September, 1993, and we should never forget that. <laughs> uh, it's uh, uh, Paris was at the time the foreign minister, mm -hmm. and he said, "Well, this is the end of Israeli Hasbara, Israeli propaganda. We don't need this anymore, because now we are going to do have peace with the Arabs." And uh, you can see how naive he was at the time. And he said, "Now we we, don't, we really don't need to spend the energy and time on and money on the, on the Hasbara or on the public diplomacy." But soon we were wrong and. Uh, the Palestinians at that time uh, found ways to uh, erect uh, channels, uh, radio channels and television channels, and Israel has been attacked from morning to evening. And, um, the, uh, the, you know, one of the biggest signs, when you want to know whether your enemy, it happens that enemies make peace with, with, between themselves. Mm -hmm. but, but how do you find out whether an enemy has decided to not recourse the war anymore, but to go with, to take the peaceful path. The best way to find out is to see whether how does he educate his children. Mm -hmm. When he educates his children that the war is ended, it has, it's over, and now we are going towards peace, then you know that this is their path. When they teach them from the age of one that the greatest uh, is, uh, the, the great, uh, the greatest achievement that they can find is that by going themselves in buses and killing as many Jews, then you know that all this is uh, is really uh, um, uh, has no basis at all, and that they, it's hypocrisy, and they never meant to make peace. But that's what happened. That's what actually what happened. They they are using their propaganda for in, in their with their own people, teaching them that the best thing to do is to kill themselves with as many Jews as possible. And this is what's happening today. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose that uh, reporters like uh, CNN's uh, Owen Lieberman, uh, people who are being uh, journalists who are being relied upon internationally by the world to depict the story accurately, even as I use uh, Lieberman as an example, who's of uh, Jewish and perhaps uh, Israeli heritage, are, have also uh, foregone their objectivity and are reporting really in a way that uh, glorifies and glamorizes the Palestinian uh, narrative and their uh, uh, movement uh, to, show, is, to portray this, themselves as victims of Israeli aggression and immorality. This is, this is a very good question. You know, it's the same story as where do you start? If you uh, try to find out 
who is an aggressor, and you begin with the situation after the Six-Day War, then um, Israel might be found an aggressor. But if you start from the Basel Declaration and you find out what the history was and how Israel occupied or conquered the uh, Judea and Samaria, then you cannot possibly say that Israel is, uh, is, is a, a, the, aggression, the aggressor and the, that uh, the Arabs are the victims. No way. So what happens is, everybody begins with 1967, with after 1967, not 1967, but after uh -huh. 1967. Uh -huh. the, same, the same thing happens here. When, uh, when uh, for example, cars in, the, in, the, in Judea and Samaria are attacked by, uh, by uh, Molotov cocktails or by stones and people are killed, nobody else is in the market. When the Jews retaliate, right. supposing when somebody takes a gun, and start shooting in the air, then all the uh, cameras begin to, to show what's happening. There was a case in, in Hebron where a, a Jewish woman was attacked violently in words and in pushing and in, 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 uh, in uh, all sorts of uh, ways, uh, a Jewish girl. You saw nothing about it. When the Jewish girl started retaliating mm -hmm. and she spat at her and she started cutting her back, then all the cameras started working. And then you see a Jewish girl uh, 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 insulting a, a Palestinian girl uh, when you don't see what happened before. So this all begins, the question really is, when did the whole thing stop? Mm -hmm. how, how would you rate the effectiveness of the existing uh, supposedly uh, Hasbara organization, uh, such as uh, Camera and Honest Reporting and the Israel Project, because it seems that uh, these organizations have been set up, uh, they're operating at least five years, some more than ten years, and uh, even the own Israeli government is, is not getting, the, uh, getting their story well managed. How good a job are these uh, NGOs doing in getting uh, the media to report accurately on the Arab-Israeli conflict as a subset of the global jihad? Well, as far as I know, they're doing their best. Only their funds are limited and their manpower is limited. And this is not something that can be done by uh, an NGO. I think, uh, I think Israel should give a hand in this. It's, it's much more complicated. It's a big, big thing. Uh, as I say, uh, the Arabs and the, uh, the liberals and the left are putting in so much energy, so much money, so much manpower, that to uh, be effective, you've got to find out the sources of this, and to attack that in a way that uh, would be would be effective and not just uh, from one case, one case to another. I see. We're speaking with Professor Abraham Sion, uh, the chairman of the Center for Law and Mass Media at Ariel University. Uh, Professor, uh, we've had in the uh, the last election just a year ago. We're uh, coming up now on the. Uh, on the inauguration of President Trump, and yet in that election, American Jews who voted 70% and 68% for uh, Barack Obama um, also voted overwhelmingly uh, for Hillary Clinton as president. And the situation that Israel is in seems to have been, uh, it seems to be understood uh, and executed, managed much better by Donald Trump. What do you suppose? Uh, is uh, how are the Israelis viewing President Trump compared to the way that Jewish Americans are, are viewing him? Well, the dark ages of Obama are over. These were really dark ages, and uh, Obama gave Israel a very, very difficult time. I don't recall any president of the United States who spoke so clearly, so uh, precisely, and so determined as President Trump when it comes to the Middle East, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fact that he has abandoned his uh, fellows of Europe because he thought that this is the way it should be and that is just. You don't find this usually. Uh, politicians and statesmen do what's good for their country. I think that Trump in the long run did good for his country, but in the short run, I think he, he, he um, he jeopardized the, uh, the uh, American influence in Europe, maybe in the Arab world, but he did what he thought was right, 
and it's the right thing to do. Um, I think Hillary Clinton would have continued Obama's policy in the Middle East, and it wouldn't have been a good policy. It wouldn't have led to any peace at all. Uh, peace could uh, only happen in one condition, if the Arabs will stop thinking of destroying Israel. If, they, if this happens, when, when the time comes and the Arabs be, come to the uh, notion that Real Israel question. cannot be, cannot be uh, yeah. destroyed, uh -huh. then, then there will be peace. And uh, do you suppose that uh, this uh, upcoming election, the, the presidential election, because there's work now, uh, there's work afoot to try and to, to impeach uh, President Trump, and that's coming from the Democrat Party, which is largely support, which which, uh, which Jews largely support. Uh, how do you feel Israel's future would be without a Republican president? Well, I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't like to think about that. I think that uh, Trump's position is quite steady, even though there is a lot of uh, attacks against him from all sides. But I think he's doing quite well, and uh, I think his policy will prove right in the end. Um, I would like to speculate on what would happen if there would be a, a democratic president. It depends, of course, who. Uh, before uh, Obama, there were presidents who were good for Israel, uh, democratic presidents. Some of them were good, some of them were better, some of them was, were, were... But there was no one who... Um, uh, attacked Israel so much as uh, President Obama. So uh, there is no point in speculating now about what will happen. I don't think that uh, in, this will come to impeachment. Uh, you know, the history of the United States, I don't recall any president except Nixon that he was was uh, uh, was anywhere near impeachment. Uh -huh. How strong is uh, Israeli support for President Trump and his, uh, his policies? You mean Israeli people, Israeli government? Yes, it's Israeli people, yes. The public. All Israeli people, I think, most Israeli people support him wholeheartedly, even those in the left, except for the non-Zionists in Israel, like the Arabs, Arab members of parliament, and maybe also one, one small fraction of a party in Israel that does not support Trump's policy. But the, the rank and file and the... Um, party, the left party, the, the Labour Party in Israel supports Trump uh, very well, uh, completely. So if the Israeli public supports President Trump's Middle East policy, particularly policy on Israel, well, uh, yeah? well uh, to, to, uh, to transfer the uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, I think you have uh, the support of most Israelis. It doesn't matter if they are left or right or center. Uh, this is something that everybody supports, as, as I say, except the non-Zionist uh, uh, fraction, which is very small. Mm -hmm. Professor Sion, how can the public find out more about your work in an ongoing way? Uh, is there a website or uh, an email with which, which, which they can uh, address you? Well, from time to time, I publish uh, some articles in the papers. I, there is the uh, Israel Today uh, paper that I published um, uh, two articles there mm -hmm. uh, on the Battle Declaration and on the 29th of November, the partition ban. And, but I intend to give much publicity when my research uh, is published. And uh, let's hope that this will happen, say, in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And this book that you're working on, uh, is it uh, is it a, a clearly a, a, a textbook? Uh, is it a book just for scholars? Well, it is a book for scholars. It is a textbook, but it's also a book that can be read by the rank and file, and people are interested in the history of the area. The idea is to give the truth and the whole truth to the public so they would know what, what, the, what the actually happened in that area in the last hundred years and to see how... Um, how hypocrite, I would say, the world is towards Israel. When, they, when you read the facts and you see that uh, the decisions were all anti, so you see that uh, it's very important to know the facts and uh, to be able to evaluate. Mm -hmm. Professor, uh, would you give the correct spelling of your, your uh, surname so that uh, the public, if they wanted to look up your uh, papers or uh, videos, so they would find you? Well, the name is uh, Zion, but it's written with an S. And you know that uh, Mount Zion is also written with an S. 
uh, not with a Z. Sometimes the S becomes a Z. So it's uh, Abraham Zion, but uh, it's written with S-I-O-N. Okay. That's great. And uh, is there a, a web page at the Center for Law and Mass Media that's uh, uh, addressable? Right. Yes. Yes. There is a page there of the Center for Law and Mass Media. They, they have quite a few articles there on the on the subject. Okay. W will you be uh, conducting uh, your annual, as you conducted in the past, a conference once a year? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do that. We'll try to do it by the end of this year to make another conference. Uh, but uh, uh, well, the policy now changed from conferences more to education. Like uh, we're trying to get uh, as many people as like politicians and ministers and to get education more than conferences. That's great. So, uh, and, and, I, the, and the school, by the way, is an Ariel University. Um, yeah. Ariel University, how would you describe uh, the location and the uh, population in the vicinity? Well, uh, Ariel University is in Samaria. It's in Ariel. It's the part of Ariel City. Ariel City has about 22,000 people. It's not a settlement of two two camels and three tents. It's a city. It's a, it's a very modern city, and it has a university with something like 15 or 16,000 students. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have students who are Palestinian, by the way, from East Jerusalem. Oh, really? we have yeah, we have students who are uh, Arabs. And we have students who are uh, Ethiopians and the Russians and from all uh, denominations from all parts of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, do the Arabs have a separate school or do they go to the, the same school as the Jews? They go to the same classes. My students, I, I uh, well, most of them, I don't, I don't know them by, uh, I don't read the names every every lecture. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know that they are Arabs until the, the examination. The examination also is not with names, it's with numbers. The names come up only later on. So uh, they can be Arabs, they can be uh, uh, Ethiopians, they can be uh, Russian Jews, uh, they can be uh, local Jews from uh, Samaria, they can come from Tel Aviv. You know, by the way, uh, the, uh, the distance from Tel Aviv to Ariel is 44 kilometers. And which Tel Aviv is on the coast, isn't it? Yeah, that's the, it's the Mediterranean coast. So that's that's the 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 whole width of the country. You're saying is 44 kilometers. I mean, no, uh, no, 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 no. It's not the whole width. Uh, the width is 22 kilometers. We we drive uh, from Tel Aviv, 22 kilometers. We come to a check post, and then we drive another 22 kilometers to get to Ariel in Samaria. Uh huh. Huh. This is so why I, I was, yeah, I was, I was raising the point of uh, the, the allegation that Israel was apartheid, and uh, it, of course in South Africa, blacks never went to school with whites. Accepted <laughs> schools. It's ridiculous. I would tell you even more than that. The Arabs are accepted on a different, on different terms than the Jews, because they uh, are not very uh, familiar with the Hebrew language, because they, when they start studying, they start studying Arabic. So me as a teacher who teaches law, many times I make I put a blind eye if I see mistakes. Like, uh, can you imagine a lawyer going to court and writing uh, words with mistakes? But I put a blind eye to let him pass. So it's the other way around. Are you saying it's a bell curve that they get uh, a little a little boost? Uh, you're you're they get, they uh, overlooking get, there. Yeah, they get more than a little boost. They get more than a little boost. But of course, I'm talking about uh, like papers when I know who's writing them. Sometimes, when when we're talking about examinations, you can see if someone if Hebrew is his language or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Because the the, uh, the education is in Hebrew, and the, the Palestinians uh, are studying in Hebrew and writing Hebrew. Right. Uh huh. But aren't these uh, people who have gone through uh, Israeli schools up even up to the university level? Well, when you talk about Arabs, yes. yes, they went to Israeli schools, but their main language there is Arabic, uh -huh. it's not Hebrew. Uh -huh. When they come to university, they have to practice in Hebrew. They cannot continue to have Arabic as their main language. Right. It's, uh, it's exactly like, uh, for example, uh, if you like, uh, when I came to America, I, I had to uh, write in English, and uh, even though my 
but the time is Hebrew. So you, you, if you come to the university, you have to apply the language of the university. Uh -huh. and you have a, a British accent. Did you uh, study in Britain as well? I did, yes. I took my PhD at Cambridge. Uh huh. Did they accept your Hebrew language as a dissertation? <laughs> no, no, no. I had, I had, I had very quickly to adjust myself to the new situation. I couldn't uh, uh, write. I couldn't say I cannot express myself because I don't know English. Uh, I would have been thrown out. I see. Are you uh, available for uh, lectures at international conferences and debates and things of this sort? Well, now I'm more involved in my research, but if I'm invited, I would come. Yeah, it depends. And on time. Part, yeah. It have depends you on time. Have participated in, the, in these international forums? Are you oh, yes, I have. I have participated in a few. But now I'm more, uh, uh, I'm less easy on that. I, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, my time is more limited, but uh, if, if it's a good conference or a conference that has uh, a meeting, then I would participate, yes. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Professor Abraham Sion from Ariel University, uh, who, who uh, commutes 44 kilometers. It, it sounds like a far distance, uh, <laughs> and, it, it, and practically into another culture. But but it's a it's a mixed culture, a culture where Israel is preparing uh, the uh, Arab Muslim students for coexistence. Are, right. are they are they uh, attending with a mind towards coexistence or towards rebellion? Well, I think that in Ariel, there is more coexistence than, in, for example, in Haifa. I also taught in the University of Haifa. Uh -huh. And uh, there is a big difference between the Arabs of Ariel and the Arab students in Haifa. Uh -huh. They are, they are much more uh, uh, violent and uh, extreme. Where in, in, in Ariel? In Haifa. In Haifa. No, in no, 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 in Haifa. But, Haifa. but Haifa, isn't Haifa an Israeli city? It is. So the, the, the Arab, in Haifa, the Arab, there are Israeli the citizens. Arab, the Arab Israeli citizens that uh, study in Haifa many times burn Jewish flags, Israeli flags. Mm -hmm. They protest against Israeli policy. They uh, uh, they uh, they are violent. Many times they are violent as well. And uh, the university gives them freedom to to revolutionize. You know. Uh -huh. they, because because they in in our reality that it's a new university, they did not come to that extreme yet. Even though they were raised in, in essentially in Samaria, which is ruled by the Palestinian Authority. No, I'm talking about Arabs, not from Samaria. I'm talking about Arabs or Israeli Arabs in Haifa. No, no. In are you saying Israeli, Israeli Arabs are studying at, at Ariel University? I'm saying that Israeli Arabs are studying in Ariel University, and some. Palestinian students from East Jerusalem are also studying. Okay, so it's technically, well, did, well would you consider them uh, Israeli Arabs in East Jerusalem? No. Uh huh. What they do they consider Israeli. themselves? Palestinian, of course. I see, because they're in East Jerusalem. Yeah. Yes, and so this is one one of the issues that in contention right now. That we had days of rage at universities uh, around the world. Right, right. So you have days of rage in Haifa many times. If I ask you one final question. So you're, you're talking about the, um, the unrest, uh, the uh, separatism from the Arabs within Israel itself. Uh, isn't Iran working on a plan with this, as they call it, irredentist, you know, rebellious, uh, hoping to reconquer Israel under Islam. If there is a, a problem as anticipated from Hezbollah in Lebanon or from, uh, from uh, Iranian-supported Hamas in Gaza, is there a problem posed by the uh, Muslim Israelis within Israel as potential uh, fifth column, as it's called, against the flag of Israel? Well, this has happened before many times. It has happened. Uh, you have all sorts of units that... Uh, are uh, sometimes caught, sometimes they uh, manage to uh, sabotage or to uh, to kill people. This, this, uh, these, you have um, extremists from the Arab students or Arab population, uh, even in Israel, not, not Palestinian, but even Israelis, uh, Arab Israelis who uh, took to arms to, uh, to kill Jewish people in, in the cities, 
and they can move much more freely because they can they have uh, an identity card which is Israeli, and they have they can drive cars which are which numbers are Israeli, so they can uh, do much more damage than the Palestinians. But they do it, unfortunately. Uh -huh. How well do you feel that Israel is protecting itself? Because, of course, during uh, World War II, the U.S., we, uh, here on the West Coast, we also had a threat from a Japanese uh, on the West Coast that they would uh, either be a fifth column on the side of the Japanese uh, or perhaps help the Japanese uh, airplanes, the bombers, coming to help guide them, and therefore at nighttime, uh, in San Francisco and in uh, Oregon and Washington, uh, people had to leave their lights off, and the Japanese people were uh, in turn into internment camps. Well, there's no comparison between what happened in the United States during the Second World War and what's happening in the, in Israel. Uh, I'm talking about terrorists. I'm not talking about people who are affiliated to a certain uh, to the to the enemy. I'm talking about people who are actually doing terror and uh, spreading terror and all over the country. So uh, they're not interned. They are those who are uh, leading a life of, uh, of terror. They are most of them are caught, are imprisoned, are tried, and imprisoned. And uh, uh, those who manage, say, half a percent, manage to carry out their uh, their terrorist attacks. Then you have Jews that are killed. Yes, it happens. I mean, uh, with the way things are working nowadays, uh, the entire water supply could be uh, biologically polluted. For instance, I mean, this is not just no longer limited to bombs. Well, let's not give them ideas. <laughs> We're speaking. We've been speaking with Professor Abraham Sion, the chairman of the Center for Law and Mass Media at Ariel University. Professor, you're, you're heading back to Israel now. After spending uh, a fortnight in the U.S., uh, what are you looking forward to in, in this coming uh, semester and the year 2018? Well, the university is getting bigger, greater. It's uh, having more faculties. Don't forget that this university is only 30 years old. And it came, uh, if you would have gone 30 years ago to the, to the place where the university is, you would have found rubble and uh, barren land and nothing nothing else. Now you have a wonderful university with uh, pupils, students who are very happy to be there and uh, who are getting into the market, to the Israeli market, uh, in all sorts of fields, whether it's engineering, whether it's law, whether it's, uh, uh, it's uh, state valuers, uh, robotica. Uh, and now we are building a, a new faculty of medicine which is going to be, I think, the fifth or the sixth uh, medical center in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the future is fantastic. I mean, we're looking forward to, to an increase and to uh, see more students and more research and to better the situation in the world. Yeah, well, you, we're now approaching Israel's uh, platinum anniversary, uh, 70 years. And uh, have you been in Israel all the 70 years? No, uh, I haven't been. I, in fact, I uh, came to Israel as a as an immigrant boy in 1951, and that was three years after the establishment of Israel. Mm -hmm. And since then, I have been a, a very loyal citizen of the country. Of course, of course. And uh, your parents emigrated from which Arab country? Well, my parents uh, originally came from Iraq. Yes. Yeah. And they had to flee during the uh, Second World War to India because of pogroms that were take, uh, carried out in the country by the Arabs against the Jews. There were massacres all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it's a long story. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's Jewish persecution all over again and again. And uh, uh, we had to flee from Iraq again in 1950-51. My father was almost hanged in the uh, center of Baghdad hmm. because of no other reason than he was an influential man and a rich man. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what happened to quite a few uh, Jews who were hanged in the, in the uh, center of the country and the, of the city. Um, 
But uh, thank God. Was this at the time of what they called the Farhud? The Farhud was in 1941. The Farhud was the first, that was the first uh, instance that we had to flee to India. Mm -hmm. We had to, uh, we went to India, and to India was at that time under British control, mm -hmm. and uh, we were there until the end of the war, yes. But there was a persecution afterwards in 1948, 1947, 1948, 1949, 1960, and the Jews had to flee. All the Jews of Iraq actually left. Uh, because they couldn't, because they they couldn't be there anymore. And of course, all her, all their uh, property was taken, was uh, confiscated, without with with no trial, just confiscated. Uh -huh. uh, there were Jews expelled from almost every Arab country. Uh, yeah. Over eight hundred thousand Jews, and then uh, of course there are uh, Palestinian uh, refugees from the nineteen forty eight war. Do you feel that it's about time for the Arab countries? to absorb those Palestinian refugees and complete the transfer of populations? They should have done it a long time ago, and Israel would have, should have demanded this many times ago, uh, many years ago, and uh, to dismantle UNRWA, which is a, which is a shame on the, uh, on the international, uh, the international uh, community. Mm -hmm. It's a shame for people to be, to be kept uh, for five, six, seven generations uh, for no other reason than to make them uh, uh, wait to come back to the to what the houses that they that they left before, which is of course uh, uh -huh. it's a, it's more an exchange of population than anything else. But the, that number of uh, of Palestinian refugees, there were much much fewer Palestinian refugees at, at the time of the war. But those who are there now uh, within Judea and Samaria. What are the prospects that uh, that Israel should argue that the Arab countries should accept them as a, in, in the transfer of populations uh, if Israel were to extend annexation over Judea and Samaria? Well, I, I, I do think that Israel has uh, any obligations uh, to uh, the residents of uh, Judea and Samaria, the Arab residents. They have full autonomy. They can uh, live their lives as they please, and uh, in fact, they uh, their national uh, aspirations should be Jordan. Uh, how do you feel about the proposal that, uh, uh, as a solution, that Jordan um, extend uh, citizenship and responsibility for uh, for policing, etc., to Judea and Samaria and Egypt to Gaza? Yeah, I think that's the way it should be, but I don't think they're going to do that. And because it's unsafe to Israel? No, that's I don't think so. If if they give national, if they take them as nationals of Georgia, that's what you're just talking about, right? Yes, but I mean, so, but still let them live, or do you, do you suggest that they be resettled in Jordan? Well, I don't think that Israel can resettle them in Jordan if there is a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan to settle them there, and they, the population would accept that. That's a different matter. Israel would not expel those people out of uh, the state of Israel. But they can have autonomy, and they can live their lives as they please, in one condition, that they don't resort to terror. I want to thank you for sticking with us, uh, Professor Abraham. I, My yes. would en I would encourage people to, uh, to follow some of your lectures. And will you still be conducting television interviews in Israel? Yeah, yeah. if time permits, yeah. Professor, thank you so much for spending this time e educating us, and uh, we look forward to a successful 2018. Yeah, thank you.